Welcome to the Bahamas. I'm Delaney. And I'm Hadley. And this is Twice As Good. Take it away. <laughs> The Bahamas is comprised of more than 700 islands and caves. It is known for having some of the most breathtaking shorelines on the planet. Later today, we'll be touring Thunderball Grotto, a stunning limestone cave situated along the shore of the western coast of Daniel Cay. And we'll visit an island which is home to some remarkable swimming pigs. We'll explore the pirating history of the Bahamas with the help of the pirates of Nassau Museum. And along with this amazing group, the Colors Junk Canoe will be learning about the music of the Bahamas. They'll also introduce us to Junk Canoe, the national parade and festival of the Bahamas. The Bahamas is a coral archipelago. An archipelago is a cluster of islands scattered across a particular area in an ocean or sea. The Bahamas is part of the Lucayan Archipelago, located in the Atlantic Ocean. It is found north of Cuba, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic, northwest of Turks and Caicos Islands, southeast of Florida, and east of the Florida Keys. In a coral-based archipelago like the Bahamas, land is formed when ocean currents transport loose sediment across the surface of a reef into a depositional node, an area where current slows or converges with another current, releasing sediment. Over time, the layers of sediment gradually build up on the surface of the reef. The resulting caves are composed almost entirely of biogenic sediment the skeletal remains of plants and animals from the surrounding reef ecosystems. Thanks to its tropical climate, the Bahamas is blessed with an abundance of indigenous fruits. Staples such as guava, papaya, and mangoes grow in abundance here, as well as a host of more exotic ingredients such as sea grapes, tamarind, and gunnip, or Spanish limes. And thanks to its extensive shorelines, Bahamian cuisine celebrates its seafood. Local fish like grouper, crab, and spiny lobster, or rock lobster, are commonly used ingredients. But far and away, the most popular seafood of the Bahamas is conch, the national dish of the Bahamas. Conch is a large tropical marine mollusk, or sea snail, that's known for its distinctively shaped shell. Both terrestrial and marine mollusks are gastropods having a foot and head that retract into a spiral shell made of a single piece. The generic name conch is applied to several different medium to large sized shells, characterized by a high spire and a pronounced siphonal canal. The Bahamas National Trust launched its conservation campaign to educate consumers and fishermen. To protect the conch, only eat adult conch, don't fish in no-take marine protected areas, and don't destroy queen conch habitats. Today, Lester Dean, chef de cuisine of Dune Restaurant, one of the Bahamas' finest restaurants, will be sharing several of his favorite Bahamian staple recipes, and will teach us about Bahamian culinary traditions. So let's get cooking Bahamian style. <laughs> Today we are we're serving our iconic boiled fish. And then we also have our iconic Johnny cake. What kind of vegetables are in the dish? We have celery, we have sliced onions, and at the bottom we have potatoes, lime juice, and salt. Then you get another pot, add about a quart of water, add your fish, and then we're gonna take these two pots and put on the stove. We're blanching the grouper for the boiled fish and then we are blanching the vegetables for the boiled fish. So now I'm adding the grouper. This process right here, right now, will take about five to 10 minutes. Now I'm gonna take the stew back to the plate up area. Now that we've finished the dish, we're gonna plate it right now. You add some pepper sauce, a slice of lime, and some Bahamian Johnny Cake. The famous Bahamian boiled fish. And it's something that that warms up your soul when you eat it. It's a breakfast item, but you could eat it at any time. It's, it's light in calories, so 
Why not? So you guys want to try? Yes. Dig in. Mmm, so flavorful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Located just west of Daniel K in Exuma, Thunderball Grotto is a fascinating system of underwater caves and caverns. Its name comes from the fact that it was one of the filming locations of the 1965 James Bond spy movie Thunderball. The island itself is composed of sharp rocks and a few shrubs, not giving a clue as to the beautiful caves underneath. During low tide, snorkelers enter the cave through a small opening on the west side of the island. Unlike underwater caves that are totally submerged, Thunderball Grotto's dome is well above the water level, and holes in its ceiling allow brilliant rays of sunlight to illuminate the internal caverns and create a spectacular hidden display. Have you ever heard the expression, when pigs fly? Well, we found a place where pigs swim. Pig Beach, known officially as Big Major K, is one of the 365 islands in the Exuma region of the Bahamas. Uninhabited by humans, Pig Beach is home to a colony of seafaring frail pigs that love nothing more than to take a dip in the ocean. There are several legends explaining how the pigs first came to the island. One theory posits that the pigs were survivors of a shipwreck that managed to swim to shore and have populated the island ever since. Another legend is that the pigs were left behind to serve as a future food source for sailors who never returned. However these pigs and piglets came to Pig Beach, they proved that there is a time and place when pigs swim. <laughs> Associated with the Bahamas. This is the Bahamas national food. The conch right here, this is the horn. The shell is about 25 years old, because you can see by the size. And this piece right here is the paw of the conch that helps it walk on the bottom of the ocean. Is the conch cooked? No, it's not cooked, it's, it's raw. However, from the lime juice and the orange juice, the citrus from it and the acid helps cook the conch a little bit. We'll start off with the onions. We'll take the onions, diced, we'll add it into a bowl. We then take diced tomatoes, add it to the bowl. We also have diced cucumber, or diced yellow peppers, diced red peppers, diced green peppers, and diced orange sweet peppers. Now we'll take the conch. The conch is something uh, similar to calamari. However, it's, it's sweet and chewy. Cut it into strips, and then you dice it. Right now, I'm cutting up the skin of the conch. You also could eat this part. It tastes no different than the, the regular conch. So you take the conch, add it to the all ingredients. Now, that's when the fun happens. You take some orange juice, and then you take lime juice. You add in the mixture. You take a spoon, you mix everything together. Now you add your salt. So we have our bowl here. I'll take it up, put it in a bowl, and decorate. Get all the juices in it. Decorate with the horn and a piece of lemon. And then that's count salad. Girls, you want to try the dish? Yes. The conch is flavored so well. And the citrus complements it perfectly. The golden age of piracy lasted for 30 years, from 1690 to 1720, with Nassau at its heart. The era of piracy in the Bahamas began in 1696, when the privateer Henry Every sailed to ship the Fancy into Nassau Harbor, loaded with loot he had plundered from Indian Empire trade ships. In order to establish Nassau as a base where pirates could operate freely, every bribed then governor of the Bahamas, Nicholas Trott, with gold, silver, the fancy itself, and her remaining cargo. We're here at the Pirates of Nassau Museum with Captain King to get a crow's nest view of what pirate life was really like in Nassau. Captain King, where are we? 
Ashanti. Well, we are in Ashanti town from the late 1700s to the early 18th centuries. The Ashanti town is made up of common things of the modern world today, such as hotels, taverns, forts, and docks. Why were pirates so attractive to the Bahamas? Well, the pirates were attracted to the Bahamas because of the many small islands, the shallow waters, and the coves. Can you tell us about the significance of the Jolly Roger pirate flag? The Jolly Roger flag, the symbol and crossbones, was used to represent death. Pirates would use it to terrorize the high seas, and when they see their victims, they would get close to them and hoist the flag to let their victims know that death is upon them to strike fair into their victims. Anne Bonny and Mary Reed were some of history's most infamous female pirates. Did they dress as men? Yes, they dressed as men because women were not allowed to be pirates on the ship, so they had to disguise themselves to sail with the crew. What happened to them? Well, Governor Woods Rogers sent out his crew to capture them, and they were captured, and they were brought back, and they were both put on separate trials, and they were condemned to death. What brought the golden age of piracy to an end? All right, Governor Woods Rogers came to the Bahamas in 1718 under the crown of King George I to restore commerce, which means the rules and regulations, back to Nassau. And him and an ex-pirate, Captain Benjamin Hornigold, they teamed up together and they captured 10 pirates. And Governor Woods Rogers had to prove that he meant business. So he hanged nine of them. And when he hanged them, he took their bodies down, put them in chains, and hanged them at the entrance to harbors to let pirates know once they come to the Caribbean and they see these pirates hanging in these chains that piracy is no longer tolerated here in the Caribbean. This is good. The Queen's Staircase, commonly referred to as the 66 Steps, was a landmark located in the Fort Fincastle Historic Complex. One of the steps has been worn away over time, but the remaining 65 steps have been preserved with a layer of brick. The staircase leads to Fort Fincastle, one of the three forts built by the British towards the end of the 18th century. Fort Fincastle, Fort Montague, and Fort Charlotte all remain standing today. A direct access route was needed to reach Fort Fincastle, the highest point in Nassau in case of an attack, so they decided to build a staircase. The staircase was hand-carved by approximately 600 slaves, who used pickaxes and hand tools to cut their way through solid limestone. It took over 16 years to complete. That was a bit of a hike. Yes. Many years later, it was named for Queen Victoria to honor her 65-year reign and her declaration to abolish slavery when she ascended to the throne in 1837. <laughs> about the grouper, how did you prepare it? To prepare this dish, I start by dicing all my vegetables. First off, some olive oil, some onions, diced onions, and diced fennel. You saute, and you add some saffron. So after the onions and fennel is nice and tender, so we take it off the stove now, and then we're gonna put it in an ice bath. The next part of the dish, uh, we have a few ingredients, but we have the blanche. We add yellow diced peppers, orange diced peppers, red diced peppers, and zucchini. Let these blanch for about two to three minutes. After this is complete, then you take these items and place also in the ice bath. Now I'm gonna cook the grouper. We have an eight ounce filet piece of grouper. Season it cayenne and salt. We then take some olive oil. We take the filet, they lay it down. And that's what you want to hear when you add it to the pan. Light sizzle. So we cook this until it becomes golden brown. Then we flip it over, turn on the other side, and finish it in the oven. We now have the grouper straight out of the oven. We're going to add grouper sauce to the plate. We then take your spoon, rub it across the top, to make a circle. Then we add basil oil around the ketchup or the grouper sauce. So you're making a slight design there. You then take the grouper aromats. We take it, place it on top of the grouper. Then take your grouper, add it onto your plate. We we'll add a few microgreens for garnish. 
Now we have the mashed potatoes. We did mashed potatoes earlier. We need quenelle it. All you're doing is cuffing the mashed potatoes with two spoons. Simple. And you place it right in the middle of the plate. Now you have the sauteed grouper with mashed potatoes. Can we try it? Let's dig in. Mmm, the grouper has such a great flavor. In the 1920s, William Randolph Hearst, an American businessman, politician, and newspaper publisher, purchased this 12th century cloister from Augustinian monks in southwestern France. After its purchase, it was hastily dismantled in France for shipment to the Bahamas. Unfortunately, the parts were not numbered, so they all arrived unlabeled on Paradise Island. It was like a giant puzzle that no one could solve. In the 1960s, Huntington Hartford, an American businessman and art collector, purchased the cloister from the Hearst Estate. The stones continued to defy conventional methods of construction until artist and sculptor Jean Castreman set about doing it piece by piece. It took him two years to recreate the cloister. Complementing the cloister are the Versailles Gardens, the multi-terrace rectangular gardens run nearly a quarter of a mile all the way to the southern edge of Paradise Island and Nassau Harbor. The length of Versailles is traversed by a stone pathway carpeted in Bermuda grass that both connects the terraces and divides each side of the gardens into two mirrored halves. Junkanoo is a street parade with music, dance, and costumes every Boxing Day and New Year's Day here in the Bahamas. Christian Justilian, assistant professor at the University of the Bahamas and leader of Colors Junkanoo, is the Bahamas' foremost expert on all things Junkanoo. Where did Junkanoo get its name? Well, there's a king by the name of John Canoe or John Connie. So it's from a name of an African king. How has Junkanoo changed since the Bahamas gained its independence in 1973? Well, I think the greatest change that's happened in Junkanoo is the introduction of crepe paper in the 50s. We used to use a lot of cloth. We used a lot of tissue paper. We started to use this. So most of the costumes you see here are made with crepe paper and cardboard with feathers and decorations. How many people participate in a Junkanoo celebration? Oh, thousands. I think Junkanoo is the one festival in the Bahamas that brings the all of the persons on the island together. Can you give us a lesson on some of the instruments? Sure. If you came to a parade, you would hear probably a lead drum starting off the parade. And they sound something like this. This is a lead drummer. And we have the bass drum. That's really the heartbeat of a junkano. And here's the sound of the cowbells. And along with that, I usually play the conch shell. So I'm going to do something with just the conch shell. And this is what it sounded like in the 50s, in the 40s and 50s. So I have that one, two, three. Now we're going to let the back line, what we call the back line, the drummers play along and then the, the horns, they're going to come and play. I'm glad you're here. I hope you come back and get a costume and participate in the parade. Yes, we will. Thanks to Junkanoo, the Bahamas is... Twice as good. <laughs>For dessert, we have guava bread pudding with guava ice cream. All right, first off, we have six whole eggs. Then we add some sugar. Okay, when you add the eggs and sugar, you whisk it until the eggs become fluffy. While you're whisking, you could add uh, your heavy cream. You could put it on the stove to be heated. As you can see, the egg is foamy. 
the colors change from dark yellow to light. So as you pour in the heavy cream, you whisk in slowly. So right now we're tempering the mixture, the egg and sugar. If you added the egg and the sugar to the heavy cream, it will start to curdle and cook the egg. So after it's fully mixed, then you, we could add guava syrup, you could add with sweetness and for taste. Then you add some vanilla, vanilla extract. You mix everything together. And this way you bring your bread, the brioche bread. You add the cream mixture to the bread. At this point, you let all the brioche bread just soak up all that mixture we just made. You don't worry if the bread looks very mushy. It's supposed to be mushy. We add chopped guava in the mixture at this point. I'm mixing it now. As you can see all the ingredients are coming together. Spray it in the middle, and then you add the mixture. All that goodness right there. Now I'm gonna place these beautiful babies in the oven. They're gonna cook at about 350 degrees between seven to 10 minutes. Now you see here, we have the guava bread pudding already finished. First you get some of the guava paste. You make a swoosh, you want to add some graham cracker. Reason being is this way you're going to put the ice cream. You're going to place it, the crock pot, right on the side. And now, the special ingredient, the guava ice cream. Right on top of the graham cracker. And that's your bread pudding with guava paste, graham cracker, and guava ice cream. Here's some ice cream. Wow, it's so delicious. Food is twice as good. Sharks are ancient animals. In fact, shark scales and teeth that have been found around the world date back over 400 million years. It is a common myth that sharks have to keep moving to stay alive. Some sharks must constantly swim in order to keep oxygen rich water flowing over their gills. Other types of sharks use the pumping motion of their pharynx to move water through their respiratory system. Sharks can hear low frequency sounds similar to those given off by dying fish from more than a kilometer away. Smell even just a few molecules of blood up to half a mile away. See objects as far as 100 feet away. Use electroreception to sense the electrical impulses that are emitted by all living things. Have taste buds like humans. The sharks of Compass K are species called nurse sharks. The origin of the name nurse shark is unclear. It may come from the sucking sound, which resembles that of a nursing baby, that they make when hunting for prey in the sand. But the most likely theory is that the name comes from the old English word for seafloor shark, hearse. The West Indian Flamingo is the national bird of the Bahamas, and it's unlikely to be confused with any other bird. Its long legs, long neck, and characteristic pink color make these birds like no other. The West Indian Flamingo has a large, heavy, down-curved bill. Great Inagua Island, the southernmost island in the Bahamas, is home to almost 80,000 West Indian Flamingos. Wetland sites here form the largest nesting ground for these majestic birds in the Western Hemisphere. From the gorgeous beaches to the wonders of Thunderball Grotto, and from improbable swimming pay to the sight of a flock of West Indian flamingos taking flight, the Bahamas is a paradise on Earth. We'd like to thank Chef Lester Dean for showing us how the Bahamas' native seafood and indigenous ingredients make the perfect launching point for world-class cuisine. We're also grateful to Captain King at Pirates of Nassau's museum for sharing the pirating history of Nassau. And of course, applause goes to Professor Christian Justilian for showing us how keeping the traditions of Junkanoo alive pays homage to the Bahamas' historic past while inspiring musicians and artists in the Bahamas today. The Bahamas is not just good, it's twice as good.
This is Good with Hadley and Delaney is brought to you by Mila. Emma Besser, forever better. Mila. And by Cuties. Cute, you can eat. Cuties. Kitchen Works. Wherever we go, that's where the party's at. Kitchen Works. <laughs>